musicians, they get up there and they take the mic and they get ready and all of a sudden they break into a song. Well, I've got a song in me I want to break out into, but I know that it will just distract you completely from the message and you're going to end up running out the door. So and then if I do that, then I, I, I've made you stumble because uh, I, I've failed to give you what it is that I believe that God wants you to have, which is the word, not me singing. Amen? Wow, that was, that was, that was a better amen than I got all the, in the past two months. That's messed up, ain't it? Hallelujah. Glory to God. A um, couple quick notes. Um, that That powerhouse couple that you saw up here in front of you, I want you to keep them in, in your prayers. Uh, I want you to pray for them hard. Um, every day, twice a day, and if you're, and if Steve, go on up, no, Pastor. Anyway, um, pray for them. Uh, God has such amazing plans for you too. Uh, you already knew that individually. Uh, now, I talked about that over in the collective So, so much supernatural in your lives that uh, um, it's going to blow you away when it happens. Uh, also, um, Tyler and uh, Steve, uh, during the first service, you went ahead and, and gave them their graduation certificate from uh, the Hope Home. If you want to see their, come on. There it is. There it is. Yep. Hallelujah. That is praiseworthy. Um, I mentioned that because I want you to congratulate them. If you want to hear their testimony, they'll be up on YouTube here hopefully within the next week or so. They cast an amazing testimony from us from rejection to coastal public uh, if there is one to know. Um, other than that, it will be out public for everybody to hear and see. And uh, Do not be surprised if some of your uh, testimony is used in the network. first service, we had a gentleman that came and joined us, and um, I, I, I could close the service with him. I was Pastor Josh told us we need to just close the service with this guy, um, because from the minute the first testimony began to the end of the testimony, the first uh, prayer he had just been weeping, and his confession was, I had everything that happened during that service speaking to that man. God be the glory. Thank you for your for your transparency, for sharing your testimony. Thank you for teaching us about what it is God wants us to do. Uh, it's warm in here, ain't it? I'm telling you, I need to pull off this heat. It's about ready to get hot up in here. Glory to God. Are you guys standing there for a reason? Okay, you are. Okay. Uh, will the little kids be dismissed? I've got like my entire leadership staff minus one standing in the back making signals at me. I'm like, what do you want? I'm doing what I'm doing. Why aren't you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Right? You know, I do, I do what I do. You do what you do. Okay? <laughs> I guess they were doing what they were supposed to do, which is help me out. Right? Amen. Ears. Mm. Put something black on them, man. Ears. Heart. Father, they have confessed that their ears are open. They have confessed that their hearts are ready. Lord, I pray that this word that would be delivered today would be delivered with laser beam precision and that it would be the seed that we all need in our hearts in our ready hearts to receive it so that it may produce the fruit necessary for the life transformation that we so desperately need. We don't want change for change's sake, but we do want to be more like your son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Mm. If I get in the way, slay me, Lord God, but you have your way. As we've already confessed, we surrender. We surrender every piece of this and every aspect of this service to you. That, Lord, be glorified.
one day, one day is not today. We will stand in your presence and give an account for our lives. We can no longer be ignorant of what it is that you say because we've heard your word and we will speak it. Now, Lord, empower us to obey your word. We will hear it now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Please keep in mind that I did not get an opportunity to preach first service because of everything else that was happening. So I'm trying to hold back the flame. Is that okay? Okay, well, I'm just letting you know I'm not going to hold back the flame. Hallelujah. This past month, we've been in 30 days of praise, 30, day, 30 days of thanksgiving. We've been in the pursuit of thanksgiving as we've continued to um, look at uh, uh, our, our theme for the year, which has been the pursuit of God and the pursuit of the different things that God has taken us through as far as the team goes. Um, next month, uh, we will be doing a, our Christmas special. Uh, I am glad to announce that it will be uh, The Grinch. We're going to name it The Grinch as a subtitle. We're going to do a Grinch Christmas only because I feel like I'm going to steal Christmas. Y'all don't like that, do you? Y'all, y'all don't, y- I like The Grinch. I love The Grinch. Don't get me started on The Grinch because I'll end up preaching, what, preaching what's about ready to come instead of what I have in front of me. Hallelujah. So 30 days of thanksgiving, 30 days of praise, 30 days of getting to this place that we are right now. Let's go to our Bibles if you have them in front of you. If not, it should be on behind my head. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 16, we'll, we'll, we'll be reading a little bit today. I have plenty of time to preach, so I'll take my time. Starting in verse 16, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Where were they going? A little help here, please. They were going to go pray. It's important to understand where they were going. So where were they going? To pray. To pray. It's a pretty noble thing, amen? She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. Verse 18. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrate and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. This is very important. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. Come on, somebody. The jailer woke up, and when the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for the light, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to get out? We need that kind of faith. That kind of faith that says, I will pray, praise, and worship. 
and to the very ground is shaken, and I am set free. Not only am I set free, but everybody else around me gets set free. Amen? We need that kind of faith that says, it doesn't matter what my situation is, it doesn't matter what my circumstance is, I will worship until something happens. We, we, we've lost a little bit of that in the church. Uh, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I don't, I mean, in, in the contemporary church in America today, we happen to be a people that if, if the preacher goes more than 20 minutes or uh, 30 minutes, other uh, people get restless. If, if worship goes, you, you, some of you, I mean, if worship goes more than four songs, God forbid if we have an hour of worship in today's culture. Every once in a while, we just need to go ahead and put. Sometimes we just need to stay in that place that says, you know what? I am not leaving until I receive my personal breakthrough. We, we need the faith of Jacob that turns around and says, I ain't letting go until you bless me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was looking at, at, at this, and, you know, and there, are, there are things that keep us from praise. You know that, right? There are things that keep us from praise and things that drive us to praise. In the end, praise leads to freedom with a purpose bigger than ourselves. If you want a purpose bigger than yourself, learn how to praise. And by the way, uh, each one of us, and and some of you, and and please forgive me, some some, some of you may be feeling like, well, Pastor, I know how to praise. I know how to get my praise on. I know how to get my praise dance on. I know how to get my shout on. If you find yourself saying that, you fooled yourself. I believe that when it comes to praise, it's like transformation. It's still a process of slowing down. We have not arrived at the end. Praise then leads us to freedom and, a, and with a purpose bigger than ourselves. We need to grasp that God uses everything to position you to praise. Let me just tell it to you like this. You have been set up. Tell somebody next to you, just tell them, just touch them and say, hey, you've been set up. This is a setup. You have been set up. Don't, 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 don't go without telling tell somebody. Look, look on the other side. And be, you've been set up. You have been set up. Some folks have the mindset that things happen to them. We, we, we have a victim mentality of saying that things are happening to me. Things happen to me. We need to change. We need to change our thinking and begin to understand that things happen not that things happen for me and not to me. Then, if you can, then you realize that you have been positioned for praise. And to praise, and and to praise God. Not only have you been positioned for praise, not only have you been set up to praise, but you've been set up for a blessing. I'm convinced there's, there's an old there's an old black church saying, and, and, and that, that, that translates sometimes, that talks about when praises goes up. My black church at blessings come down when praises go up, blessings come down. There's a truth to that, by the way. There's a truth to that. That we need to understand that it's in that place of praise and that th- th- that specific place. I'm not just talking about your happy church praise, I'm not talking about the pastor induced praise. No, I'm talking about a praise that comes from the inside, deep down in here, when you just can't control it. When somebody turns around and just says, how are you? I'm just blessed. And it's all up. You know you know them folks. You, those are the folks you want to be around. Sometimes they get you sick a little bit, but that's okay. So you need to be around them folks. You understand? No, can I get at least one amen? I'm up here preaching by myself today. <laughs> Look. challenge you. The next time you're feeling like, 
this is this isn't for everybody. Because some of you don't go through this like I do. But the next time you're feeling down, the next time you feel a little emo, the next time you just you don't want to go outside and you just want to be by yourself in the dark and, and eat ice cream. Chocolate cake. No. The next time you feel What's that one? Kid? I got to talk about Charlie Brown because we got that Charlie Brown Christmas tree downtown. So, uh, what's that one kid that walks around and like the cloud is following him on Charlie Brown? What's his name? Oh, th- oh, that's Dirk. I thought that was a cloud of rain or something. My bad, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Let me make some observations first. In verse 16, I could have probably titled this and called it "Roadblocks to God." There are many obstacles when you're trying to serve God. You see that in verse 16. Verse 17, I I, I love this mess. I I, I would have loved to just preach this one, but I know that when I do this, some of you do get offended. And and trust me, I'm not trying to offend you most of the time. I I just want you, verse 17, when I look at the character of Paul, and many of you, you, you've you've been in, in the teachings when I've done teachings about Paul and so on and so forth. I love Paul. Paul is just like a real down-to-earth kind of guy. Paul is a man that understands his authority in Christ and understands what authority he has and doesn't have. Paul is a man that ain't scared of nobody. Hello? Verse 17. I could have just called this, please shut up. I want to tell you, there are some people saying all the right things. There's some people that just say all the right things, but they're serving hell. Do you know that you can get around some people that, that just talk good? I ain't got enough. I ain't got enough vocabulary to talk good. But you got some people that, that, that you get around them. They'll say, oh, praise the Lord. You anointed, Pastor. You the man. You the man. That, shut up. My ego can only take so much. Hello. Uh, ministers in, in, in the house, please understand this. If you feed on that from people, you're feeding ego. And we need to be careful with that. Please understand that, that, that we do need, as, 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 and as ministers of the gospel, and most of you are seasoned, go- are, are, are seasoned preachers, if that's what I'm speaking to, it's good to receive some type of feedback. It is encouraging because it does build you up. The Bible does talk about using, for people to use encouraging words to build up the body. And guess what? You're still part of the body. But when we feed on that alone, and, 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 we, and we turn around and we, we preach a message, or we sing a song, or, or we do this, or we do that, or we, or we feed people, and everything just goes just right, and, and, and you're waiting for somebody to turn around, you're waiting for me to come around and say to you, uh, good job. I didn't need to. You did it for Jesus. You didn't do it for me. And if you did it for me, you got a deeper problem. Hello? Is this thing on? I feel like, yeah? Am I good? Okay. Please understand that when you're dealing with these kinds of people, that you can't let them get on the or maybe I should have gone with verse 18 and called it enough is enough. There are some annoying people that must be dealt with. Must be dealt with sore. Some of you have seen me deal with some folks, and, 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 and I'm, not some, I'm not the nicest guy when it comes to dealing with some folks. Because either you're here because you want life transformation, or you're here because God's called you to something, because it's something that God wants you to do. If you're not, if you're here for a good feel, for, for a, a feel good, you ain't getting it. That's just the truth. This thing's gonna annoy me, isn't it? Oh, I'm gonna have to eat it. All right, sorry. Now we get to go old school. Now we get to go old school with this thing. Yeah. We good up over there? You got me under control here? All right. 
Maybe it's verse 18b. Sometimes when we deal with annoying people, and maybe I could have called it, why not now? Something may not happen immediately, but I want to tell you it will happen in time. Verse 19 is probably one of the, probably, this is, this is one of those verses in the Bible that we're either, as ministers, we, we either like to preach or we stay away from preaching. I could have called it, show me the money. And we could have just been talking about your money for the next 30 minutes. When you mess with people's money, and we notice this in, in the scriptures, is that you get to see really who their God is. Let me say that again. When you mess with folks' money, you really do get to see who their God is. Luke 16 makes it clear. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. It's interesting how a personality is given actually to money. Let me just jump in and give you, I'm going to talk about four things real quick. The first one's going to be demonic devices. And this is just a quick side note on demons. Most of you know my position about demons and some, and, and I want you to understand that demons are real. But we ain't hunting demons around every corner. You follow what I'm saying? We ain't ghost busters, we ain't ghost chasers, we ain't demon chasers. But we do understand that they're real. Verse 18, Paul, but the Bible says that Paul became so troubled. Do, do you, do you, when scriptures talk about, and especially when you, when you read the New Testament and you, and you read about Paul, anybody here emotional? Anybody got emotions? <laughs> that should be everybody, pretty much. Um, anybody, and you can confess this, it's okay. Uh, anybody like, like me? You know, like I'm talking about, I'm talking about everything's like a red zone. You're just like up here. I'm not up here all the time, but, but, but you're up. I mean, it's, it's emotional all the time. It's either fantastic or catastrophic. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? It's like every little thing. I, I, I mean, it, it's part of the ADD kind of, I don't know. Uh, it, but, but, but you're just like, it, listen, 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 listen. I'm going to set you free right now. For you people that are like me, I'm going to set you free right now. It's called passion. It's called passion for life. Don't judge me. That's what it is. Don't drug me because I don't need it. You follow what I'm saying? <laughs> I was, it, it snowed the other day, right? And um, uh, Kadre was in the hospital, so we went to go see Kadre. He had an allergic breakout or whatever. He, he, you saw him. He's fine. Thank God. And um, we're in the hospital, and, and, and my wife and I are walking down the hall, and at Reading Hospital, I looked out the window, and these big old fat snowflakes were falling from the sky. And I turned around, and I screeched. I'm telling you, I screeched like a 10-year-old girl. I was like, it's snowing! Once that happened, that came out of my mouth, I realized, oh, my goodness, there's two doctors in front of me. The one lady, I'm telling you, it was probably the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. But I, I'm, I'm a red zone, okay? I'm just passionate about everything. So I screeched, and I realized... I'm a 47-year-old, I'm, I'm 245 pounds screaming at the top of my lungs like a 10-year-old. Look, I intimidate people just by looking at them. And here I am. Aah! I'm telling you, it was a high-pitched voice. And as I walked past the doctors, and I'm thinking to myself, I got to get out of here fast. I am so embarrassed. So as I'm trying to get out of there, I look at the doctor. She's looking at me. I'm like, look. If I would have grew up in this day and age, they would have medicated me. <laughs> and she said, and she was, I guess she caught on to the joke and she looked at me and goes, yeah, I got a few of those patients too. <laughs> Don't stop me from living life, amen? Don't be stopped in, love, in loving and living life. Hello? So that's one of the things about Paul that you have to understand that Paul is a passionate man. You can see by his dialogues, you can see by his actions, you can see about how he's described. And the Bible says here is that he was troubled. That means that somebody got on his last nerve. Here's the truth. Demons are real. Ephesians 6, we know, for the struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers 
of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil and heavenly realms. Demons, and this is what I want to tell you. Demons will not mess with you if you aren't doing anything. There would not have been a demonic encounter for Paul in this particular case in Scripture if he was not on his way to... I gave you the answer up front, see? If he wouldn't have been on his way to worship, if he wouldn't have been on his way to go to meet God, a demon had to present itself to try to hinder Paul on his way to prayer. Some of you had to go through hell and high water to get here today. Some of you had some drama before you, uh, before you got here today. Some of you had trouble before you got here today, and you were trying to figure out why now, why today, why me? Is there an amen out there? Demons are real. And just as we, we, we took a, a side note here on demons, let's take a, a side note here on people's perceptions. I, I love the testimony today of, of the men that gave it today as far as, as, far as graduation goes. And, 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 this, and, and maybe for some of you that have just, for some of you that have just came, come to know the Lord, that just got saved, let me tell you this. For others of you, you know this because you've experienced this as far as part of your past goes. And that is that not everybody's happy or was happy when you got saved, delivered, or healed. Not, every, not everybody was shouting and praising God when you came to know the Lord. How many can say amen to that? So, some of you even thought that you could go ahead and kick it still with the old crew and the old gang and the old clique and the old this, that, and the other and realize that they're just hating on you. Haters will be haters. What's that song? Don't do, I <laughs> Family members, friends, co-workers. Look, when I got saved, I, I was 23, 24 years old, Marine in Okinawa. I was probably one of the hardiest partiers, drinkers, womanizers, blah, 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 down the line that you can go. When I got saved, my own troops turned against me. Why? Because all I could tell them was about Jesus. Before they went to combat, I made sure. Hello? Do you know Jesus? <laughs> Sergeant Noah lost his mind. Talk about Jesus all the time. They don't have nothing to do with me. Why? Because I realized in that moment, I still realize this today, and it's part of the calling of God in my life, is that tomorrow is not promised. There is an eternity that we're looking forward to. There's a God that we will going to account for. The Bible says that we all will die one, that we all will die. And then there's the judgment. So they weren't all happy. Your schedules change. Your commitments, uh, uh, your commitments, your commitments change once you get saved. And what's funny when we read this is that Paul and Silas were not whining, were not winning. Excuse me, were not winning any popularity contests. When they when they got attacked, when they got when they got uh, a called before the magistrate, they weren't the most popular people because somebody started messing with their money. They started messing with their money. They took away the girl that was making money for them. Their God was money. I also want to tell you that, that, that in that light, in light of that, is that we have to keep in mind that commitments can keep us from praising God. The wrong commitments, the wrong energy, the wrong focus in an area can keep us from uh, uh, praising God. Good things, and here's the, here's the tough part. Good things can keep us from praising God. And you can go ahead and scrunch your face at me a little bit if you want, because that, that one there doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Like good things. Do you know that we can get up and we can get, we can get caught up in doing so much good that we forget to do God things? Not all good things are God things. For, for my overachievers out there, the ones that are, that are always trying, for my people pleasers out there, listen, not all good things are God things. You can get caught up doing what may become very natural to you and what people expect you to do. But that isn't necessarily what God wants you to do in the season. Hello? When I, when I, uh, uh, um, uh, when I first started serving at a church um, over there, 
Um, I remember, um, as many of you know, I, I've got a computer. I've got a degree in computer science, and and that's that's my forte. That's my forte. Um, and I remember being at this church. I was still. I, I knew that God had called me to to, to this, to, to whatever this is that I'm doing. That's what He's called me to. Um, and I remember um, a friend of mine. He was working in the in the audio video. Basically, what Cheyenne and, and what Tyler are doing back there right now took care of video, took care of audio, took care of the computers, whatever the case is, and they were working on a website. And he came to me, and I remember he was in the hallway. He said, "Hey, hey, CJ, why don't you join? Why don't you join the multimedia team?" And I said to him, "No." I said, "No, I, I don't feel, I, I don't feel that God's called me to that." And he and he gave me a lecture about using my talents towards multimedia. And I, I, I was like. That's cool, but I know, I know where God has me right now. I'm, I'm currently studying for my credentials. I'm, I'm on the street preaching. I'm, I'm going wherever God, wherever God puts my hands that's, to the plow. That's what I'm doing the work, whatever. i got a small group that's going on. I don't want to get caught up in multimedia. Very angry, caused us some, some, some hardship in our friendship. But just because that's where my talent is, doesn't mean that that's where I'm at in that moment, in a season. Now, with that being said, understand that all the multimedia that happens here at this church, whether it's uh, the video, whether it's the video worship, whether it's the computers in the back, whether all that stuff, it, whether it's the website, I did it. My, I'm still using my talent, but I didn't have to use it in that moment and in that season. It just took some time before God brought it to fruition or before God wanted me to use it. Are you, are you tracking with me a little bit? So please understand that some of you in our, are in a being, I, and, I, and, I speak, and, and I'm going to speak directly to the herds because I love the herds. Everybody, everybody knows the herds. They're like my favorite couple, you know. And one of the things that, 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 that I, I had encouraged them with is, is as you go in the season of preparation where they're going to school at the Northeast Ministry School, so proud of them. They're getting ready to go. Uh, they're getting ready to go do, like, amazing things for God, okay. But in that season that they're in, I encourage them. say, said, listen, just because this has been your forte, this has been your strong point, you know, everybody knows John is a handyman. Everybody knows John is, as, as he was a, a former director of the home and all this other kind of stuff. Just because you've been there doesn't mean that that's where you need to be there. Enjoy your season. Same thing with Anne. Anne loves kids. She loves people. She loves women. She loves... That doesn't necessarily mean where you have to be at right now. It doesn't mean it's not where you're supposed to be. It just means that take some time and discern. Is this going to get in the way of the goal that God has set before me in this season? Amen? Men that come in the home. Some of the men that come in the home, they come with skills. And, and let me tell you, I covet those skills. Men that come in the home with carpenter skills and electrician skills and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, yes, a church project. Okay? But I, I forget that I need to maintain first things first. I need for them to maintain the discipleship aspect first. And then we can move forward with projects. That doesn't mean I ain't putting them to work. Can somebody say amen? personal condition sometimes we need to be driven by, by, by driven to worship and driven to praise sometimes uh, we see here they've been beat down and beat up I wonder how many of you sitting here today I, I heard I think it was Melanie I was, I was in the back um, and she it was, was it Melanie that asked the question of, 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 of some of you are just tired some of you, was that you? yeah was that you? that was prophetic to, to, to pose that question, how, how many of you have just been beat down and tired? I'm talking about just like exhausted by, by, by just life. Anybody, exa anybody e exhausted with life? Sometimes, sometimes you get so exhausted. It, those that have worked third shift know what I'm talking about. That you, you, you work and work third shift that you try to catch up and enjoy life, but you can't because you're just so tired. But how about being beat down and tired? Sometimes it's a matter of being just sick. And you get sick. Or just sick and tired. Maybe it's just sick of being tired. Personal condition. That beat down process that Paul and Silas, you know, it's one of those things that you look at that and go, that's what happened to them. They got it stripped down, beat down. Maybe, maybe it's, it's self-inflicted. Do you know that, that, that as human beings, we have a, 
a way of self-inflicting pain on ourselves. And I'm not talking about the good stuff. I ain't talking about going to the gym. <laughs> I ain't talking about that pain because that, that's supposed to be good pain. It don't feel good in the moment. Can someone please say amen? <laughs> you go out there, you work it out, and you come back the following day, you're like, I'm so sore, my butt cheek. <laughs> Hello? No? That's just me? Okay. But, but, but that, that, that's, that, you don't know that it's good for you in the moment because you're in pain. Anybody ever go through physical therapy? Look, my first day in physical therapy after my surgery, ask my wife. I cried. No, no, I literally cried when she tried to touch my leg. Screamed. <laughs> no, I can't move my leg. I thank God she put me through some of that pain. Because now I can move my leg. I ain't getting on no trampoline again, though. Hello? But we love to self-inflict pain. What are you talking about, Pastor? How about some secret sin? How about that stuff that you think nobody knows about? That happens in the dark place. Can I encourage you? The secret place should be reserved for God. Mm. That's a word right there. The secret place should be reserved for God. That's where, if you've got a secret place, it should be because that's where you meet God at. Hello? Well, we love to self-inflict. Secret sin. Maybe, maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's not one of the top ten sins. Hello? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you ain't out there, you know, stealing and robbing and killing and, and cheating on people and all that kind of stuff. Maybe, maybe it's just, how about this one? How about the little ones? about a little bit of unforgiveness, some resentment, some anger? We don't like talking about those because, you know, we, we, we justify. Can I tell you that we good, we, we good about justifying stuff? This is how we do it. Well, brother, it's okay. We all do it. No, it's not okay just because we all do it. It's still sin. Unforgiveness today is still sin. Come on, everybody. Sing it with me. Let it go. Let it go. Cold didn't bother me anyway. Told you I was going to go there. Y'all don't want me to sing. Hey, Joe, this is what happens when you're not here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Resentment, anger. How about, how about some bad habits? Your personal condition when it comes to bondage, when it comes to addiction, the question that you have to ask is, what has you in bondage? What has you in bondage? And some of those things are self-inflicted. Some of those things are not. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's the voice in your head that says you can't praise God in your current condition. You can't praise God because of, 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 of what, you, what you've done, where you've been, who you've been hanging out with. Can I, can, can I let you know? That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from the... And if you're telling it to yourself, stop. Because you're lying to yourself and you're believing the lie. Hello? That makes me want to get my, 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 my high-pitched anger voice out. Let me yell at you a little bit about it. Here's, here's what it is. It's the story of the elephant. Many of you have heard this story. Amen? Anybody know how you train an elephant? You wonder how these big, how these big old two-ton, four-ton, I don't know how big they are, but elephants are, 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 are trained. Does anybody know how that happens? What they do is they get a baby elephant, okay, and they wrap a shackle along its leg. And that shackle, very heavy shackle, is, and weighted down, is then pinned down to a stake. And what that ends up happening with that elephant is that the elephant ends up thinking that they can't break from that shackle because so many times and for so many years they've tried to break that shackle, but can't. As the elephant matures, it's still thinking, it's shackled. 
as it gets older and bigger, the shackle is kept on its ankle, making it think it's still in bondage, but the chain is removed. And the elephant doesn't go anywhere. If you have an elephant that needs to be retrained, you don't even need the stake anymore. All you got to do is put a heavy chain on it. Because as it drags the chain, it thinks, oh, I can't go any further. Many Christians are in the same mindset. Many Christians have been set free from the chain, but have not realized that they need to get rid of the shackle as well. That was deep. That was deep. I didn't get an amen on that one. Wow. By the way, my notes tell me that um, the elephants are about three to five tons. Present location. The story has a very interesting flavor to it because as we read the story, we realize that Paul and Silas weren't just beat down. They weren't just beat up. Anybody, uh, this, I may have to talk to my Hispanic folks in the house. Anybody ever get whooped naked? No? No. I've been whooped wet and naked. Okay, my mama one time, because I forgot to do it. Well, the night before, I talked back to my grandmother, and the following morning, I was supposed to do the dishes. Mind you, she, get, she gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work. Dad wasn't around at the time. Anyway, so I got in a fight with my grandmother, told her off at age 11. Hello? And I was supposed to do the dishes while she was gone. So uh, 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 I didn't, Okay. And she comes home. I hear the 1972 Nova drive up. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to get in the shower. I'm going to go out and play. I, look, I was a hood rat. I'm just telling you. So mom walks in the door. Mom walks in the door. And I'm like jumping in the shower. I'm like, this is cool. I get soaked up and lathered up. Look, she kicked that door down like, poof. Busted out la chancla and whooped me wet. To this day, I have not forgotten that whooping for the rest of my life. I will talk about it as long as I live. I can still. And, and when you wet naked, there's nowhere to hide because everywhere she touches hurts. It's a sting. Yeah, mommy, no. See, ah. You just like curl up in all kinds of. No? None of y'all been whooped good, have you? Y'all need, you, okay, thank you. Thank you. Amen. My, 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 mom, my, 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 uh, my family calls it una pera de cuadrito. That means, that means you get whooped so bad they put squares on your body. So Paul and Silas have been whooped naked. Then they were thrown into the jail. But watch this what the Bible says. The Bible says that the guard took them into the inner prison. We would understand this for today as known as solitaire. As if it wasn't enough to go into solitaire, he put shackles in on them in solitaire. Are you feeling what I'm saying? This is probably, this is probably the darkest, wettest, most uncomfortable position and place that Paul and Silas can be in. How many of you have been there? How many of you are currently there? In the worst, darkest, this is a place that, honestly, if you try to visualize it, there's no light, there's no hope. I'll, I'll prove, uh, the Bible tells us that there was no light there. There's no hope, there's no light, there's no, no chance of redemption, no chance of, 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 of rescue. You, you go to that place and, and you're depressed, you're hopeless, you're frustrated. You, you, you have been, you've convinced yourself as the elephant that, that no one understands. How many have been there? Were you in that place? Maybe you're there now. Were you in that place where it's like, you don't understand what I'm going through. Oh, but you know, Pastor, uh, 
I'm going through this, this, that, and the other. So I'll say, well, I've been there too. No, 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 but you, no, 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 no. That's your response. No, 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 you don't understand. And the truth is, you're right. Because I caution our, our, ourselves as we try to empathize with people, as we try to console, not counsel, console people. There's a difference between consoling and counseling. Ain't none of us up in here, unless you got a degree in counseling, can counsel. I don't even counsel unless it's biblical. Hello? This is what the Bible says. This is what you do. That counsel comes from the Lord. But console. How many of you lost a, uh, a mother or father recently? Within the past year? Cheyenne. Two years? Three years? Four? Five? More than ten years you've lost your parents. Okay. This is what we would do. And, and Cheyenne is, is still ripe at this. And, and please say amen if I'm right. You try to console him in his mourning because we, the Bible tells us we should mourn with those that mourn. Amen. We should feel what he feels is basically the, the teaching there. As I do that, I'm going to console him. But I have to be careful. Because my initial response is to say, I know what you're going through. No, I don't. And the reason why is, is because my loss, your loss, and, and I'm not trying to minimize our losses. Because our losses are, 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 are very depending on the relationship, can go very deep and can hurt a lot. Are you, you following what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not minimizing the loss, but we've been separated by time and space. In other words, we've had some time to deal with the, with the emotions and, and maybe some guilt and maybe some forgiveness and maybe some whatever it is that we're dealing with in our mourning process. We've dealt with that. However, for someone that has lost their parent, in the past year or a son in the past year or whatever that emotion is still very raw it still hurts it's like picking at a scab that hasn't completely healed is it healing absolutely but you can't pick at the scab amen so for 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 those of you that have lost a loved one especially now going into the holiday seasons and then birthdays and those kinds of things where, where they were special now those those emotions are raw and though I'm trying to be compassionate and though I'm trying to console you for me to say I know what you're going through is, is, is an understatement because I've already been through it and therefore I have some time and space amen what I can say is I'm here for you I'm praying for you I'm believing with you both I know that you both have lost is anybody tracking with me yet? So you go to that place, you convince yourself that no one understands. And the truth is that no one does understand. But because no one understands, please take this piece of advice with you. Do not isolate. It's the wrong time to isolate. Let those with good intentions that love you in there. To be there. This is when we get to practice just a ministry of presence, which is ministry of being there. But see, here's the beautiful part about it. In that dark place, in that crazy, hopeless place, always remember, Jesus came to be the light. In that dark place. In that dark place is where, where Paul and Silas, dealing with, with, with all their drama, dealing with all their trauma, because they have been traumatized. They were on their way to prayer. They were doing the right thing because it was the right thing to do. They were serving God. They were preaching the word. They were believing for, for healing. As a matter of fact, Paul just casted a demon 
Come on, somebody. He's getting whooped. He's being thrown in jail. And in the midst of that, in the midst of his body bleeding, in the midst of the hurt, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of everything that's going on in that dark place, him and Silas decide to sing. To sing. The Bible says to sing hymns. I don't think it's the same hymns that we sing today because that was way back then. But I'm telling you, they were songs that, were, that, that, were, that, that, that God wanted to hear. There were songs that were pleasing unto God. There were songs that, 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 that Father God sitting on the throne going, Jesus, check this out. You hear that? Look. Angels, hey, gather around. Watch this. See that? You see that? Paul's guardian angel, whatever his name is. Go down there. Because they're loving on me. They're praising me. As a matter of fact, let me, just, let me just touch the earth right now. This is how I see it. God going, let me just, let me just touch. Let me, let, let me just put my finger on this situation. How many of you need a, God's finger on your situation? Let, let, let me just touch the, let me just, let me just cause a little, uh, let me just cause a little tremor. An isolated tremor. With no fault line. Hello? And that God could turn around and shake the entire place. Because the praises went up in the middle of the situation. Amen? They were driven. Would they have praised God the same way if they were not there? I don't know. My guess is that maybe the Bible would have told us so. But it doesn't. It's silent. I'll make the assumption. No. Because it's in the midst of, it's in the midst of our worst situations. It's in the midst of the biggest traumas in our lives. It's in the midst of the, 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 the worst suffering that you can possibly think of. That you really get to know God. You get to know about his mercy. You get to know about his goodness. You learn to, you learn to, to see his grace. You learn to see his power. You learn how awesome and amazing he is. How loving he is. I think Silas and, 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 and Paul were there and began, were just so convinced. They got to a place of just being so convinced of God's promises, of God's promises. They sat in that dark place, and Jesus became the light. They knew. They, 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 they sat. They remembered that God said, I will not leave you as orphans. He, he, he remembered. They remembered that I will send you the comforter. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. They remembered and the promises of God. I have overcome the world. They remembered I have a plan for you of peace and not evil, a future and hope. They became so convinced of God's character and they just, just began to praise his name and, and began to just talk about, I, the, the hymns had to praise his name. I, I think they, they, if, it been, if, if, if it's me there recording this, I think I would have I heard them talking about Elohim, the, the absolute total power of God. God is creator. We see him in Genesis 1.1 1, 1. or, or Helvasaboth, the, the, the Lord of hosts, uh, the general of the angelic army. They, they began to be in that place knowing that, that nothing's impossible for God. They began to receive God as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace that in the middle of my drama, he is still my peace today. No matter what may happen, no matter what may fail or fall, he still brings me a peace that, 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 that surpasses my own understanding I think they were in that place and they said hell should die oh God the almighty you are the God that rescues you are my Jehovah Ra the God of constant care we see him in Psalm 23 I think they realized in the midst of their shackles in the midst of the dungeon God's name as Jesus who came to save them from their sins. Hallelujah. I was in New Orleans 
after Katrina, I had, and many of you I've, I've shared the story with before, and keep it short, simple. There was this old lady there, I mean, old in the sense of elderly. And as a chaplain for Billy Graham, we were there to minister just hope and minister of presence that we were down there for. And I remember, got there, and she was like, Chaplain, would you, would you come look at my house? I didn't want to look at her house because I had already seen so many homes destroyed by this flood that happened in New Orleans. And, and she said, would you please just come into my house? And to, 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 to try to console, I did, and I opened up the door, and just like all the other homes that I had seen, there, there, was, there was her living room, her furniture, her stuff. It looked like somebody poured it into a giant blender and poured as much sand as they could into that blender and they whipped it all up together and it was there and they were, they were just trying to salvage like little pieces of clothing that they could hang outside. And I remember being there and, and, and me and, and, and my partner, we were there and we had nothing for them. And then there was her, her son who was in his 50s, so imagine how old she was if her son was in her 50s. And he's telling us the story about uh, how he's been separated from his wife and his children aren't, aren't he, they, he doesn't know where his children are and, and they're scattered throughout and it, this is their situation. It's hopeless. And, I, and I'm recalling it as if I was right then and there and we made this giant circle and my friend Steve, who's, who, who was very tall, very uncoordinated, he loved Jesus. He didn't know anything about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But hey, he was willing to receive. And <laughs> I think that day he did. And, and uh, I was led by the Spirit to say to her, Ma'am, um, I don't know what you're going through. I don't. But would you lead us in prayer so we hold hands? And, 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 and I'm holding one hand of Steve. And Steve is a very tall, six, four foot white man. And he's, he, the spirit just comes on him, and he's swinging his arms all the way out. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, he's going to hit somebody in the head. <laughs> so I'm trying to hold his arm down because he's really getting into it. And this woman begins to pray. And she starts off with, God, would you, would you talk to FEMA? Would you help them out so they can release the funds that we need? God, the government is a mess. Can you, can, you, can you step down and do something about the government? The people around here just don't know what's going on. Can you let them know? And she began this, this prayer that was critical, that was just about all the stuff that was wrong. And then something happened that quickly. And then she said, but Lord... I bless you. But Lord, I thank you. And she, got, and she began, and Lord, you're amazing in the middle of this situation. You are God and you're awesome. You'll deliver us and no matter what's going on, you're still. And all of a sudden, you can see it. She got set free in the middle of her praise. We got done. Steve was about ready to speak in tongues. I was just a more than a mess than I am now. And her son, 50 some odd years old, that didn't know the Lord, broke down in my arms and began to weep and to cry and accepted the Lord right there because he saw how awesome and amazing God is and can be in the middle of the worst trauma. And I did absolutely nothing but say, God, only you can do this. If I could have the worship team, please. Overcoming hindrances will become a testimony for God's glory. Please know. Just as much as I shared about this 50-year-old man, 50-some-odd-year-old man, 
going through the worst crisis of his life, watching his mama praise the Lord, made him realize how awesome God is. Please understand, people are watching. People are watching, especially the ones that have held you captive. The story here in Acts 16 is such a beautiful story because at the end of the story, which I didn't read, not only does the guard accept the Lord, but he then takes Paul and Silas home and his entire household is saved. The power of a testimony in the middle of a crisis can make the difference. Passing a test simply means that you are ready for the next level. When you find yourself in that place, know that you are dead smack in the middle of an open book test. Take the test. Give God the praise because he's preparing you for the next level. Would you please stand? I don't know where you're at right now, and I don't know what you've been through, and I don't know what you're going through. I just trust God. I, there are some welcome cards. Actually, in your bulletins, there are tear-offs. And this is what I'm going to challenge you to do. Grab a bulletin. Tear off the contact information. Fill it out. Put your cell number on it. And take that contact card and personally give it to me. If you want me to be praying for you this week, tell me what your prayer request is and personally hand it to me. In recent months, my heart has been breaking for the church. I can't explain it. It's not that my heart hasn't broken before for the church. And it's not that my heart isn't broken for the church. Yeah, you can leave them right, right there. I should just be yeah, wherever Right there on the inside, for, for, for those of you that ignored the bulletin, right there, pull it out, put your number on it. I don't need you to fill the whole thing out, just name, phone number. Something has been happening recently to me, and my heart is broken for the church and for the city. I don't want to say in a new way, but in a different way. Because my heart's always been broken for the city. But it's different. I can't explain it. I can't philosophize on it. I can't. I, I just know that it is. Would you bow your heads with me, please? If you would like prayer this week for whatever your situation is, would you just extend a hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you that did put your hand up, please fill out a contact card for me. I would like to say and, and be the one that says, oh, I'll remember. But I'm not going to remember. But if I have a contact card and I put it in my pocket, when I get home, I see this and I, and I pray for you and I weep over you and I, and I believe God with you. And, and then during the week, it'll be laying on top of my kitchen table and I'll see him again. And I'll, and I'll be like, oh, oh, oh this person is prayer. God, what are you doing? When you meet that need where you come through in a mighty, powerful way. And that's why I ask for those. Can we do like one song and then from there we'll just...